Good afternoon and welcome to our webinar on strengthening communities through risk avoidance, mitigation, and response. Uh, my name is Jeffrey Lubell. I'm director of the Housing and, Com uh, and Community Initiatives at AFT Associates and uh, the co-director along with Thierry von Bastelier of AFT's Risk and Resilience Method Center. APT is a mission-driven global leader in research evaluation and implementing programs in the fields of health evaluation, uh, uh, I'm sorry, health, social, and environmental policy and international development. I sit within the housing and community practice of APT's Social and Economic Policy Division. This is the latest in a series of webinar conversations sponsored by APT's Risk and Resilience Method Center that explore how a risk and resilience framework can strengthen social policy across a range of different policy areas. Prior web webinars have focused on climate change, mental health, and asset building. Today's webinar focuses on housing and community development, delving in particular into uh, the system for preventing and responding to homelessness as a case study for a broader application of a risk and resilience framework to the housing and community development field. Ordinarily, I'd start by providing an overview of, the, of a risk and resilience framework, but we're joined today by Rolf Pendel, one of the foremost thinkers on how a resilience framework can help strengthen social policy. So I will happily defer to him to, to provide this introduction. Since 2010, Rolf has been director of the Metropolitan Housing and Communities Policy Center at the Urban Institute, uh, whose mission is to open minds, shape decisions, and offer solutions through economic and social policy research. Um, for a dozen or so years before that, Rolf was a professor in the Department of City and Regional Planning at Cornell University, where he taught courses and conducted research on land use planning, growth management, and affordable housing. We are also joined by Jill Kaduri, a senior fellow and principal associate at APT, who is among the leading thinkers on housing and homelessness policy. Prior to joining APT, Jill was the longtime director of the Policy Development Division in HUD's Office of Policy Development and Research where she worked to integrate the results of HUD's internal and external research analysis and program evaluations into the design of HUD programs. The format for this webinar is largely an informal conversation. Rolf uh, and Jill will each use a very brief PowerPoint to introduce some key ideas. Um, uh, there you go. Uh, Rolf and Jill will each use a very brief PowerPoint to introduce some key ideas. I'll start by asking some clarifying questions and then introduce some broader topics for conversation. As we proceed, we'll open up the floor for questions from webinar attendees. Uh, please type your questions into the question box and we'll do our best to get to as many of them as possible. Um, you will all uh, be on mute so you won't be able to talk. So use that, uh, that question box for any questions or any comments. Uh, and please note that this webinar uh, is being recorded. So Rolf is going to start with an overview of a framework that he uses for thinking about ways to strengthen social policy by reducing, mitigating, and responding to risk. Uh, after discussing this framework in the abstract, Jill will drill down and discuss some ideas for applying a risk and resilience framework to addressing the challenge of homelessness. Uh, this case study should give us an opportunity to explore more concretely how a risk and resilience framework can help strengthen individuals and communities. We'll then, we'll then broaden the conversation and talk about the implication of this approach and other potential applications of these principles. We are looking forward to the discussion and to your questions. So, Rolf? Well, thank you very much, uh, Jeff, for the invitation to, uh, to join you and Jill in this conversation. was, as it happens, our uh, program officer and um, kind of shepherded this, shepherded this uh, work through uh, MacArthur. It was led by um, uh, Margaret Weir, so I want to uh, uh, acknowledge Margaret and her leadership um, uh, in the network. Um, so as we were developing this idea of resilient regions, um, as, as social scientists and as, as folks who are interested in policy, um, we struggled and I, I think, uh, you know, grappled fairly well with, the, with, with um, dealing with the fuzzy concept. A fuzzy concept, uh, resilience, 
sustainability, all of these are concepts that are sort of broad and fuzzy sounding and they can mean many things to many different people. That can be a problem, but it also can be an asset. Um, I, I first sort of started thinking it's just more trouble than it's worth to have this, you know, big fuzzy term. Um, but I, I'm sort of living within it now and I can really see its value. Um, and so to introduce yet more fuzzy concepts into the conversation, since I'm not done uh, with resilience yet, I thought I would um, also talk about vulnerability, precariousness, and turbulence. As, as three ad additional factors, I think maybe as, as um, entryways into thinking about resilience. Um, so challenges to resilience, which I'll get to what it means in, in another minute, um, can come from a number of different levels. Um, first, and I think a lot of the things that we're talking about and thinking about uh, with social policy has to do with the fact that people can be vulnerable for a whole lot of different reasons, like the slide says. So at the individual level, um, people, uh, and not just people in households, um, but, but people can be vulnerable uh, because of their race, disability, their age, uh, and, and so on. Um, language ability, uh, immigrant status, so a lot of different individual things about a person can make them vulnerable to a shock or to a stress, uh, and those shocks or stresses from their environment uh, or from um, other people uh, can lead them to perform less well, can harm them, uh, and in fact can sometimes even um, even kill them. Um, a, a second uh, sort of factor issue is that there are precarious situations. So for example, households can be more precarious um, in the face of these shocks and stresses uh, when they have only one adult and, and, and you know, one or more children than when they have two adults in the households. That doesn't mean that every household with that structure is naturally precarious, um, but it's sort of a tendency to be precarious. Uh, housing units can also become more precarious as they age. So this is sort of the next level out if you want to think about that. Um, in the, sort of the nest, nesting an individual within a situation, um, the situations can be more or less precarious. And obviously sometimes pe uh, vulnerable people end up in precarious situations. Um, and, a, and a third sort of level or a third scale um, is at the broader city, region, national, or even global scale. When we're thinking about environments which can be turbulent, um, either because of sudden events like those shocks that I mentioned before, uh, or episodes, or because of stresses that last for uh, longer periods, medium term, long term. Um, and so that, those, are, those are sort of three situations. And you can imagine that if you're in that red spot right in the middle, um, uh, you, you are at fairly serious risk of vulnerable person within a precarious situation in a turbulent environment um, is the kind of person who is most likely, um, sort of at least metaphorically speaking, is most likely um, to be subject to, to harm from, um, from a shock, either that comes from within themselves, within their situation, or within the environment. Um, and so where does resilience come from? I think the, the conclusions, if we reached any conclusions as a, as a network, about how regions build resilience is it's because of institutional factors, institutional features. So what is resilience? It's the ability to respond to and provide So it's the resilience of vulnerable people uh, and neighborhoods in the face of rapid land price escalation, right? So, you know, you might have a community that's really resilient in that, you know, in that constant, in that context, but not so much in another. Um, so here's the example. Um, uh, th there are maybe some phases that we can think about of a resilience process that institutions, and that means government, that means uh, local, um, local uh, community organizations, that means the private sector, and so on. Um, can either avoid, um, don't go, can go, I'm going to wait for that for a second, avoid, mitigate, or recover, um, avoid the, the shock to begin with or the stress, mitigate from the shock if it does occur, and then allow recovery for those uh, whom it affects. So those, those are just some examples of gentrification here. I, I think Jill is going to talk um, about um, homelessness, not necessarily using this grid, but we may be able to sort of refer back to it you know, over time. But the idea is that, that a resilient region is one that is arranged 
so that avoidance, mitigation, and recover uh, and recovery can all occur for the problem that they're working on, uh, and uh, and and thereby, especially when they're moving into avoidance, uh, move into re a resistance framework in which they're re reducing vulnerability, precariousness, and turbulence um, in the first instance. So a good governance process, to go back to the first slide, um, can be aimed at um, reducing the number of or the level of vulnerability, the reducing the precariousness of situations or the number of precarious situations, and reducing the turbulence of environments so that at, even though we may have um, those situations still remaining, at least they don't coincide quite so much. Um, and that's pretty much, that's my framework for um, we're sort of setting this, setting the, go setting the stage. Back. So we want to go back. Okay. Wow. Well, uh, there's a lot there. Um, let me just ask you a, a few clarifying questions before we get to Jill. So, um, you know, just take, kind of taking a step back. A, a lot of people, when they hear the term resilience, they think of climate change, right? I mean, uh, uh, you know, how can this uh, community be resilient in the face of natural disasters? And and and, um, and but but you're clearly taking this concept and applying it to a whole range of other social policy contexts. And I'm, you could just talk a little bit about what's the benefit of that? Why, why should we be sort of taking this metaphor, this concept, and applying it across the board to these other social contexts? So let, let me sort of help sort of, sort of rephrase it a little bit. Why should we? Uh, versus why do I? Okay. Yeah, sure. That's so I, I'm not necessarily advocating that this be, you know, everybody's view on how we ought to arrange our thinking about social problems. Uh, but having lived in the network, in the, in the Building Resilient Regions Network for long enough, um, it became a, a useful framework for me to think about the, the different ways in which societies, cities, institutions, organizations can approach their problems. Um, there may be some regions, and in fact, I think there are some regions and maybe some problems that are more amenable to approaching through an individual avoidance um, uh, kinds of, uh, you know, kind of approach, or an individual recovery kind of approach. Thinking about how to do that as well as, as possible, I guess I would say it's better to prevent if we can, um, but there may be some unpreventable things, and so having an approach that says, you know, this is the box that we're going to be mostly working in and trying to understand the limitations of that part of the, of the grid, I think irrespective of the problem, it, it, it gives you some, it, it gives you starting points and it allows you to diagnose what you might be missing and also what you are doing right now in a way that says, yeah, we're doing that so well that we, need, we don't need to worry quite as much about the, the, other, the other boxes in the grid. And I guess I'm really speaking more about this grid here. Right. Yeah, you know, you know as, as someone who's, co-directing a method center on risk and resilience, I obviously can appreciate um, the, the idea of focusing on risk and really organizing our um, policy around how do we prevent that risk from happening, how do we help people um, who are exposed to that risk sort of be less adversely affected in terms of the mitigation, right? And, and the recovery is really about how can we help them respond to that and be in a position so they're less vulnerable the next time around. Um, my question, though, is, 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 is at what point does this framework kind of swallow up all of social policy, and, and is that a good thing or not? And I'm thinking in particular about your first box in the upper left corner there. You know, so if we're trying to help avoid, have fewer vulnerable people, all of the, our policies that, that promote income building, income <coughs> maintenance, or asset building would seem to fit in there. And so at, at what point does this, becomes such an overarching framework that it's too broad, or, or maybe that's its benefit. I, I'd be interested in, in your thoughts. Well, I, I think all of those those programs that are aimed at individual support, I think the idea is all of those can only go so far that if that's all we have, we may be spending a lot more than we need to, um, uh, considering that there may be other, um, other options to go in, in, in uh, reducing the risk in the environment. Um, I, you know, I'm a planner, as you know, by background. I come at it from land use uh, and environmental planning and thinking about where we build neighborhoods, um, where the freeways go, where the transit goes. Um, and, and so people end up in, um, you know, in, in lousy neighborhoods in part because of those decisions. If, if we don't turn that around, um, if we don't plan the neighborhoods better to start with and then 
turn it around, you know, as we're as we're building the United States, we're going to add another 50 million people to the United States between now and 2050. You know, that's a huge opportunity to think about, you know, not just business as usual and offering supports to people who will inevitably, quote unquote, live in poor neighborhoods, but in fact to say, how how can we reduce our need for those kinds of supports to start with? It has to be, I think, a dialogue between social policy and the individual supports on the one hand. And, and broader sets of policies, and that's, I, I think, you know, the, the, the regions that are successful allow the people who are dealing with those individual systems and with the regional systems to encounter each other and to say, you know, let's prevent, and then they'll say, well, let's recover, and they come to an understanding about the nature of the problem and how we can solve it through a governance process, and that's not government, it's a process of, of interaction and informed um, interchange with some foresight and um, and analysis built in. You know, I, your 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 point I, is a good one. I think about sort of laying out all the options and helping people to understand that that even though your option might be on this chart, it may not necessarily be the most cost effective or the most beneficial in the long run. And so, uh, having a full um, sort of sense of how you might approach the problem allows for better decision making. And I think that gets applied and it's a kind of a good segue to Jill because part of what I think Jill as building resilience. Well, um, homelessness is a rare event. Um, it's hard to predict. Um, it happens to very few people. It's a bit like natural disasters in that sense. Uh, about a million and a half people come into homeless shelters in any particular year in the U.S. Um, that's only about half a percent of all Americans and only about three percent of all those who are below the poverty line. And even if you add people who are homeless outside of shelters and don't come into a shelter during a year, it's still a very rare event. Um, prediction, the best attempts to predict homelessness have been done by researchers in New York City. Uh, they applied a screening tool to families who applied for homeless prevention. Um, and they identified the 10% who had the highest risk of actually becoming homeless. Um, they did find some predictors, age of parents, age of children, um, moving a lot were all pretty good predictors. Um, but even so, about half of the people that they identified within the top 10% did not become homeless. Um, and um, Dan O'Flaherty at Columbia University has, has, in my mind, the best sort of construct about what causes homelessness. It's, the ki it's risk factors. Um, but it's also bad luck. It's events that, that are unpredictable and that tip people um, into homelessness um, besides the vulnerability that they that they had to start with. The difficulty in predicting homelessness doesn't mean that targeting prevention to those who need it most is not possible. Um, there is some promising evidence from a program in New York City called Home Base um, that uses neighborhood characteristics as a way of targeting homeless prevention. Um, that program focused on the neighborhoods from which most people enter New York City shelter system. Caseworkers did outreach to those neighborhoods and provided conflict mediation mediation, limited financial assistance, such as paying rent or utility arrears, um, moving costs. Um, the program has been studied, actually our colleagues here at App studied it using a control group, rigorous methodology, and showed that the program did in reduce the number of nights people set, spent in shelter. Um, the targeting wasn't great. Most of the control group also didn't enter the shelter system. But the cost was also fairly low, only about $1,300 um, per household. 
Another way of targeting homeless prevention is to have institutions such as the criminal justice system um, identify people who are at most immediate risk of falling into homelessness. The, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the idea of using systems such as criminal justice and the child welfare system and the behavioral health systems um, as a way of identifying the highest risk people um, are that these are systems that people don't join just in order to get a housing subsidy. I mean, nobody wants to take antipsychotic drugs unless they need to do it. Nobody wants to be in danger of losing their children. Uh, on the other hand, setting up institutional relationships between these systems and um, the homeless prevention or whatever um, um, is being offered to help people fo prevent falling into homelessness can be pretty tricky. An alternative to trying to target homeless prevention is not to try to target to those who are at greatest risk, but instead to lower risk factors for a large number of people. Um, strengthening the social safety net, something that um, Rolf and Jeff were sort of debating whether this should be so broad that the solution to resilience is simply to have a strong set of social safety net. Well, in the context of homelessness, it's clear that strengthening the social safety net is the best approach. Uh, the evidence that housing vouchers prevent homelessness comes both from studies at the household level and from studies at the community level. Household level studies show that poor people randomly assigned to get voucher assistance become homeless at much lower rates than poor people without voucher assistance. Studies at the community level show that more vouchers for poor households are associated with lower rates of homelessness on, on the community level. And other parts of the social safety net, food stamps and Medicaid are important creators of resilience as well. Um, another alternative that people are becoming interested in because of its potentially low cost is to provide insurance that protects renters against the bad luck that makes them stop paying the rent and ultimately leads to eviction and for some people leads to homelessness. Um, or one could make emergency loans available to people who are at the brink of becoming homeless. Um, or even to people who have spent a night in the homeless shelter, um, but all they need to go back to being housed is some cash. Um, so, you know, so, so basically I think that um, this is a useful way. Um, the risk and resilience framework is a useful way to, to help us continue to think about um, the difficult issue of how um, we um, combat homelessness, lower the incidence of homelessness through prevention strategies. You know, um, it's really interesting. I, I, I'm reflecting on the differences between your, the, the, the programs at the bottom and the programs mm -hmm. at the top. And, and the programs at the top are, are, are essentially ways to augment people's resources generally yeah. um, so that they are better able to, to do it, lots of different things, including mm -hmm. paying their housing costs. But they're, right. right? Right. But the, they tend to be fairly expensive. Um, uh, they tend to have very, uh, be required indefinitely. I'm not criticizing them, but, but I'm contrasting them just with the yeah. programs on the bottom, right? Well, I, I think the contrast is a, a useful contrast. I also think that we, um, we're, we're, we're kind of pulling back from acknowledging that we need a strong social safety net in this country, and I think that's a mistake. I mean, I think one of the strengths of our economic system is that we have an extremely broad income distribution that really adds to the efficiency of our economic system. But what that means is that we have a lot of people um, in poverty. We have a lot of people, even people who are working at the lowest wages, um, who need food stamps, who need housing assistance, who need Medicaid. And I, I think that just because uh, we seem to be in a period of failure of political will um, to keep that safety net going. I don't think we should pull back from saying that that is what you, we should be doing. Sure. But, but look at the insurance programs, for example. I mean, uh, if, wouldn't that augment the safety net to have a program that would provide insurance against eviction? I, I think renter's insurance is a really interesting idea. <clears throat> People have suggested that 
Um, it can substitute for um, large security deposits. It can substitute for screening. It might even lead to lower rents. So that there, there are all kinds of interesting possibilities. Um, owners of rental housing may, might even be willing to pay part of the premium. Or um, government could experiment, govern either the federal government or state or local governments could experiment with doing it and to kind of test um, how much subsidy would be needed in order to get such a system of renter's insurance going. So I think that really does hold a lot of promise. Yeah. So Jeff, you said a minute ago that you thought sort of the social safety net you said indefinitely. But you know, there, there are there's, people are also thinking about time limiting some, um, in fact, not just thinking about but you know, doing, they're, they're moving to work agencies that are um, uh, sort of uh, federal housing agencies that are um, that are providing housing vouchers temporarily and at a shallow level here. So it, it seems like you might be setting a false dilemma between deep assistance for uh, a family who's vulnerable now and is under the assumption that they'll always need it, um, and then having renters insurance, which is sort of shallow and you know and, and maybe you know are there mid ranges here? Does the new does a new version of the social safety net? Um, you know, look maybe a little bit more like a trampoline um, that people can land on and, and you know move, move back into, as opposed to thinking about it. I, I mean, we'd like big on metaphor. I, I was going to say, I think <laughs> the, the, one of the main benefits of being in that research network was acquiring all these wonderful uh, <laughs> metaphors. Um, I, I guess my question would be this: so I, I, you know, I, I'm sure you'll appreciate that. That I think these are empirical questions, right? We can study, mm -hmm. and we should study the effectiveness of all of these different options. Um, uh, what's attractive to me, though, about renter's insurance um, is that it's something we can provide essentially indefinitely. Um, it's specifically designed to prevent the worst things from to protect people from some of the worst things from happening, um, and it kind of provides a foundation at relatively low cost. As Jill said, it's potentially we we know landlords are paying for renter's insurance already to insure themselves against loss. It, it doesn't benefit the tenant. Maybe they'd be willing to share the cost. I mean, there's a lot of benefits to it. I just think it's something that's really worth studying further. And I also, Jill, I like your idea about maybe some emergency loans, which also are sort of a crisis avoidance kind of thing. I, I'm um, not saying these are answers instead of giving people enough resources generally, uh, uh, but but they may be more politically achievable uh, in the short run and potentially could have some real benefits. I, I, well, I think I think repayable emergency loans are are also a good idea. I mean, not all um, not all people who fall into homelessness are leaseholders. Many of them are um, sharing housing. Many of them come out of um, broader family situations. They've never been leaseholders. Very few of them are homeowners. Um, but um, I I think of structuring emergency loans in a way that um, has sufficient um, repayment possibility, or people expect they're going to have to repay the loan. Even back to AFDC, um, we really have very little knowledge about how those programs are structured, how they're um, implemented, how they're working. And so that's another area for, um, um, for exploration, for um, serious empirical study. Jill, can I ask you a, a question? You said uh, in the previous slide that it, it's um, difficult to set up the institutional um, relationship. And you know maybe you could expand on this a little bit because you know in my limited knowledge of homeless sort of the response to homelessness, homelessness has been something within the federal government as well as locally that has um, sort of galvanized enough attention for multiple institutional stakeholders to come together and to think about how they can each 
use their institutional capacity to help get a handle on the problem. So, I, so what? So why do you think in this case it's difficult to get? To I think the, you're. I think you're talking about the ideal of strategic mm -hmm. planning and program design at the local level. I mean, there's this thing called the continuum of care. Um, which in theory includes all the mainstream systems. In practice, it rarely does. In practice, it is usually a vehicle for um, planning and shaping the use of um, federal homeless assistance resources and whatever local um, resources city budgets largely are uh, particularly focused on, on homelessness. Mm -hmm. I mean, what I meant about, now I've heard people say we should not make the child welfare system a pathway into housing assistance because that's putting a burden um, on an already overburdened system. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that there, the, the, I mean, what you call governance, mm -hmm. um, which is how you create the institutional relationships which make this um, Seamless is 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 very. It's important. It's what needs to happen. It's also very challenging. Yeah. In fact, you know, there, there even seems to be challenges um, coordinating resources between the housing system more broadly and the homelessness system. And it, I think it leads to some tension and there's some odd outcomes. You know, for for, for example, one of the criticisms that I've heard about uh, homelessness prevention programs is that it's really difficult to to identify in advance and predict who's going to become homelessness. So if you take resources that might otherwise go to helping people once they're homeless, and you, quote, divert those resources, end quote, to people who might become homeless, but we don't know for sure, you end up wasting those resources in the sense that you're benefiting people who would not have become homelessness and homeless. And I, I'm just wondering, how, how would you kind of think about, how do you think about that, and how would you respond to that concern? Right. I think that the way I'd respond is to say that prevention really shouldn't be the primary um, duty of the homeless services system, um, that that is a limited and discrete system, and, it, and, and I think that communities have probably made the right decision when they have not focused those resources very much on prevention, but instead have followed the kind of long-standing policy that began way back in the 90s of trying to focus as much as possible on um, the, 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 most, um, the, the most vulnerable people and those who um, use the most resources both within the homeless services system itself by spending lots and lots of nights in expensive emergency shelters and, and also which have costs to other systems as well. But, but that leaves the question as to who is going to implement some of these ideas that you raise. And it, 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 it could be, right, that, that we've drawn this line between housing and homelessness in a way that leaves this gap. So we have, we have institutions like housing authorities that are devoted to providing ongoing rental assistance. Um, uh, and we have institutions that really focus on helping people once they're homeless um, uh, sort of find permanent housing. But what we're missing, I think, is this sense in the middle of how do we help the, the many people who don't have housing assistance to avoid eviction and avoid situations where they end up in trouble. And, and whose job is, is it to do that? You mentioned the TANF agencies. But we, what we lack is, I think, an effective web of coordination across the housing and TANF and homelessness fields and perhaps even a, a shared way of defining the problem so that people might see that renter's insurance, for example, does advance a purpose, even if that purpose is not the same as helping the most vulnerable people who are homeless. Um, I would like, you know, you're, you're really asking who's going to do this. I think ultimately the states are probably the most useful um, public level institution for doing this because uh, it's generally at the state level that um, all of these agencies that are responsible for um, different aspects of social policy come together. I'm not saying that that has happened or that it, but I'm saying that that's probably the right way to create, the right level of government to try to create this loop. Okay. 
So I would encourage people, if you haven't submitted questions and you're interested, we, you know, we have about 22 more minutes and um, we're going to kind of weave in some of the questions that we're getting uh, uh, from you all. Um, one question here, um, uh, I'll read, this discussion about people receiving benefits in perpetuity made me wonder if individuals are receiving benefits like SNAP, are they truly gaining resilience? It seems like it leaves them vulnerable to program funding cuts, et cetera. I think it's an age-old question, and I think you, you really have to ask, you know, which which people are we talking about in particular? So, for example, a lot of people who live in federally assisted housing are disabled or they're seniors. Um, probably they'll need the assistance for the long term, and the number who are seniors and disabled is just going to grow uh, over the next 20 years um, because the baby boom is moving into the retirement. Uh, the number of senior renters is going to more than double. Um, and, uh, and that means uh, a lot of low-income uh, folks are, are going to need long-term assistance. Um, for for young for younger people, um, there is uh, you know a lot of you know hand wringing and and difficulty in figuring out exactly you know how much uh, dependent um, uh, the welfare system has has bred, and we reform the welfare system to reduce that dependence. We we haven't reformed um, the mortgage interest tax deduction to reduce the reliance of the rich uh, on, uh, on uh, federal subsidies for living in large expensive houses in the suburbs uh, or property tax deductions and, and that, you know, that kind of stuff. So, uh, you know, everyone is dependent to a certain extent on the federal subsidy that they get um, once we start talking about what that dependence does to people and whether it in fact enables them to do things that they want to do. Um, you know, we need we need to know more. But certainly, it it would be better if we had a system that supported people's self sufficiency. Um, you know, because because people have a lot of capacity. We need all hands on deck. The number of working into age adults as a percent of the total population in the United States is is going to be declining. So we need to design a social policy that 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 promotes people's productive participation. Um, in, in labor and allows them to maximize their their creative potential in that way. Uh, you know, that's a you know maybe that's a slippery way um, to, to answer the question. There's there is lots of evidence from many different patterns about many many different observers um, about dependence on federal programs, not so much on the mortgage interest deduction. This, this one might work uh, well for Jill. Um, <clears throat> The question asks, do you maintain an account to pay rent for patients who relapse or are rehospitalized? I think this may be the question about uh, people uh -huh. who are mentally met with I, mental illness. I think I, I think I know the I think I know where the question is going. Okay. Uh, and it's an excellent one. Um, it has to do with what you know, what happens to people who um, are either in rental housing they're paying for themselves or they may have a rent subsidy that's helping them pay for it. Um, there are people with behavioral health issues and that part of the recovery process may be that they are hospitalized or that they're um, in, in a recovery institution for a while. And isn't it important to have policy most need homeless prevention assistance. I think it's a good example, too, of, of how a, kind of a risk and resilience framework helps you think comprehensively and holistically about, about a challenge. So, mm -hmm. you know, the question really is what are the different ways in which people may be vulnerable to risk? And, 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 and this is one of them that you might not otherwise think about. It's all you're doing is saying, how do we help these people once they become homeless, <laughs> instead of asking, how do I try to reduce the, the incidence of, you know, risk and, and, and people's, people's likelihood of being affected by it? So one of the things that the um, network, MacArthur Network, that I was involved in um, found was that th there are certain regions where elected officials, um, mayors in particular, 
are now getting together with each other and you're tackling problems across jurisdictional boundaries. And when the mayors get involved, um, they, they have the authority to call the civil servants and the other folks who are working locally on the problem as, as sort of part of, of a bureaucracy. They, they have the power to call them together and ask for different kinds of information and, and different kinds of, um, uh, of, of solutions. So I, I'm sort of still here mulling um, Jill's um, sort of thinking about the, 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 the level of siloing right, that happens mm -hmm. among agencies. Mm -hmm. And what is it that, you know, what does it take to, to, to de-silo, to, 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 you know, to reduce that tendency to say this is all mine? It, it sometimes takes political, it often takes political leadership among people who are responsible for the general well-being of the members of their community and for their economic prosperity to say we need to solve this problem, we need to work on this together, and I'm not going to rest until I have an answer. And by the way, we're also working with five or six other mayors throughout the region who also have their own capacity that they can, that they can um, bring together. So, so what do you think about that? I mean, maybe it is the, the mayor that ultimately needs to pull together all these different... I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with the state level right. point because I think that's critically important for the local elected yeah. officials. I, I, think it, I, I think that depends very much on um, what part of the country you're talking about and how big the state is. I mean, it's very different to say um, the state of California, everything is done at the county level appropriately because California is huge. Um, for Rhode Island, clearly, it, it really should be right. the state level. Right, right, right. Um, sure. but, and, and obviously there are gradations in, in between. So here's a question. I'm, I'm intrigued by the vulnerability plus bad luck frame. If housing vouchers are about reducing vulnerability and renter's insurance is about hedging bad luck, might a combination of the two mean that we might rethink the 30% of income standard of vouchers, go to 40%, plus provide insurance for people above the ELI threshold in order to expand the number of vouchers? And I, I would just add to that sort of thinking from the Bipartisan Policy Center's commission where they actually suggest really focusing vouchers on the lowest income people and uh, providing some other type of assistance, perhaps one like what you've suggested in terms of some type of eviction prevention assistance for higher income people who might not have the same level of vulnerability uh, day to day but do suffer from bad luck. Um, you, you, could, you could think of this as, as, as you stated, that renter's assistance would help the vulnerability of people who are above the income limit for housing assistance. Um, I, but I also think, going, you know, going back to the question, sure. there's nothing perfect about the current formula for housing assistance. It's been modified over time. Um, many years ago, we went from 25 to 30 percent of income. We, went, we lowered the level of payment standards. There's obviously a point below which the amount that you're giving people to help them pay the rent is so trivial that it's not going to do the job. But I, I, you know, I, I don't think that we have to say that the way housing assistance currently is structured in terms of the benefit level is a, per, is a perfect level. Just reminds me uh, really how little we know about the effect of our policy decisions, right? But these are, again, empirical questions that we really could study I mean, some of them were studied, you know, in the original voucher allowance experience. But those were decades and decades ago, and the context has changed. The programs have grown up. Um, you know, there, there, there are some, uh, there's a question here about sort of other areas uh, where this um, might be applied, this concept, and it might be a good time to just take a step back from the homelessness context. And, and um, this question, says, this framework seems very functional for assisting people in bad situations. Could you possibly explain how this framework could function for refugees and asylees? Mm -hmm. That might be one that requires some, some thought, but I, I'll just say, uh, as give people a little more time to think about it, um, you know, to me the question is how do you prevent risk, mitigate risk, and, 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 and help people respond to it? So uh, the first question I would ask is, are there things you could be doing to really slow the, um, you know, to stop people from becoming refugees in the first place, yeah. right? So if, if wars are driving people uh, to be refugees, the, you know, the answer is, is, is really to focus in part on trying to deal with that situation um, 
you can also mitigate their circumstance by trying to accommodate them where they are rather than having them sort of, you know, be moving, uh, you know, to other countries. Um, and then once, but of course, again, we tend to focus on the crisis once it's already taken place. So all of our focus now is on how do we help the people, right? And, and, and we give money to set up refugee camps. And I'm not criticizing that. We need to do that. But if we think more broadly, we might move further up the food chain. And, and this framework can help us think about some of the other options. I, I think you've said it. I think you've answered the, the, the question. Um, it, it, anyone could have predicted, thinking about it a little bit, that we would have tragedy in the Mediterranean right now, a year ago, based on how unstable the, the Middle East has become, um, and, and North Africa. Um, it, it's obviously, I mean, there's, there's some economic refugees, there's some people who are political refugees, the economic refugees, and, and immigrants are also partly immigrants, uh, economic immigrants, who don't have a livelihood in their home countries any longer because of the political instability. But that's, it's not unpredictable that that, that that would happen. It's, you know, so, so the European community and the United States could be doing a better job right now. Um, and there are clear, I mean, obviously with refugees there, there's the complicating issue of how much the host country wants to permit refugees to integrate into that country. Um, but there, there are clearly things that are that are that are not right from the standpoint of resilience. Um, most Syrian children living in Turkey in refugee camps are not in school and have not been in school for a long time. This is clear, and part of that has to do with what language to educate them in and who controls the politics of the education. But clearly, that is something that if you come at it from a Resilience framework is not good. Not to not to educate a generation of children. Sure, I'm 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 interested in kind of going back to your example, Ralph, from your slide, and maybe it makes sense even to go back to it. This idea of, you know, neighborhoods with rising rents and home prices, um, potential for something we sometimes call gentrification, sometimes called displacement. Um, this is you know it's again a situation where we tend to react. Once, mm -hmm. once this has already taken place, yeah. right? We're, we're five steps behind the problem. As a result, it's very expensive um, and challenging, you know, to deal with. So, yeah. can you talk a little bit about how a resilience framework can help us think about uh, the problem of gentrification? Well, I, I guess my favorite box is the upper right one because um, I'm a planner, right? I like avoiding avoiding the turbulent environment to start with, mm -hmm. uh, and that's really thinking about gentrification as um, as an extreme manifestation of a shortage of um, reasonably good places to live for everyone across the income spectrum in, in decent locations within a metropolitan area. Um, it probably you'll have neighborhood change even if you have enough, but it will be much more limited. Um, but I know indeed even you know Houston, Texas right now is, is experiencing very rapid gentrification <coughs> excuse me, of neighborhoods you know, inside the inner loop. Does Houston have enough uh, cheap apartments? Absolutely. To, to me, focusing some of the attention on gentrification and its causes on the way that regional land markets are working and what we ought to anticipate with baby boomers wanting to retire into the city and millennials rising in the city, you know, what, you know, what kind of neighborhoods are people going to want versus 20 years from now when the millennials may in fact want to move out? What's going to happen to those neighborhoods then? It seems to me that gentrification, even when it's at its most rapid, is not that rapid. It doesn't happen overnight. Um, it's predictable. We know the kind of thing that leads to it. And therefore, there's, there ought to be enough time to focus on some of the kinds of policies that you've laid out in this grid. You might think so, but you know the people who are really at the forefront of the property market 
um, are probably already buying up the land in those neighborhoods fairly long before there are the external manifestations um, of gentrification. There are people who are, just like at the urban fringe, um, you see the agriculture continue, mm -hmm. but underneath that, there's a, a, a quickening of the pace of the transfer um, of land parcels that unless you're looking for the pace of, of land transactions, if you have a really good handle on that mm -hmm. in neighborhoods and you can really see it happening, then you may be right. But not many cities are, are you know, have their finger on the pulse of their own land transactions to the extent necessary to really be able to say that's going to be the next hot neighborhood. We know it because we see the land changing hands. I would argue that the, um, in addition to trying to predict the places that are going to be subject to these pressures. Um, a big problem is that we don't really have the policy toolkit in place. And it takes a long time to, do, to, to, to develop the political will to, to have the right policy toolkit. And that political will typically doesn't manifest until the problem is so extreme that it's late. I mean, for example, if, if, if part of the policy toolkit is inclusionary you know, zoning, whether it's you know very strong incentive policies or requirements and some type of tax increment district that could allow you to sort of capture some of the increased property values and it's preserving you know if you wait until the rents have gone through the roof and all the rebuilding has taken place you've missed this huge opportunity to have those things in place so it's to, it, it's a matter of kind of having the policy toolkit ready having the political will necessary to push it through, applying it to the right places in the right time. And I think, I, I don't want to say it's because we haven't adopted a resilience framework that we haven't done this. I think it's because we don't necessarily think very comprehensively about our housing strategies and very proactively. So We're let me, constantly yeah. reacting rather than being proactive. So let me put in a pitch for the latest project that I've been working on at Urban. It's called Mapping America's Futures. You can just Google it, Mapping America's Futures, Urban. Institute. Um, and what it's meant to be is a way to envision the future of the whole United States. We've taken population projections from the Census Bureau and then local observations of birth, death, and migration. And we have 27 different scenarios of population change by age and race for commuting zones for the whole United States. So it's like metropolitan areas, but it covers the entire area of the United States. And, and the idea of this tool is to say, well, we're changing. The United States is is changing in huge ways demographically. The baby boom is going to retire and then pass away. The millennials are coming up. We're getting more diverse. Population is growing fast in some places, not so much in others. What does that mean for federal policy on immigration, on housing, on infrastructure, on all these other systems? How are those policies going to come down to earth in different ways in different parts of the United States? How can we look forward to the, the future that maybe we want to have and think about what the policy basket that we need right now might be so we get the future that we want uh, instead of looking in the rearview mirror, which is always what we're doing. We're always fighting the last battle. We're always thinking about what we might have done to prevent the gentrification we have right now, which, in fact, maybe our next problem is going to be all those people are going to move out. Uh, and so now we have a com completely the wrong basket of policies to deal with the problem that we have because you know, we're, always we're always catching up with ourselves. So that, I, you know, Jared Diamond, whose work I like sometimes, wrote this book up called Collapse with one case study after another of, you know, good and bad responses to environmental crisis. But he, he picks out foresight um, and it's sort of foresight and intelligence. APT delivers it, Urban Institute's trying to deliver it, the, the study of how things are working, but also anticipation of what might be interjected into a governance process. So that, so that we can make better decisions collectively. That, to me, is what resilience is. I think we also need to look at institutional development. I mean, mm -hmm. one thing that concerns me is the fact that the affordable housing industry doesn't seem to have learned to work in high opportunity neighborhoods, mm -hmm. including gentrifying neighborhoods. It's um, sort of historically locked <coughs> into particular communities. It didn't need to be. It doesn't need to be. But again, there's a kind of, yeah. uh, of leadership or, or system-wide thinking that needs to take place in order to create that institutional change, which will be important um, in order to achieve some of the, some of the kinds of avoidance and mitigation and recovery that you're talking about. So we have two minutes. 
Uh, we do have a few questions. Uh, unfortunately, we're not going to be able to get to all the questions. Uh, there's some good ones, and I apologize um, for that. But I, I do think we kind of need, need to wrap this up. I just want to ask uh, each of you uh, if you want to just say one, if you have a final thought, you know, something you want to leave us with that might um, uh, help people think about how, how this framework might be useful uh, going forward. Well, I, I feel on the spot. Um, I, I think I pretty much said you know what I what I need to, but I I, I do think that um, the, the whole, I I, I want to hear more uh, over time, maybe conversation with Jill um, sometime in the future about you know what makes a really good interagency um, homelessness uh, uh, sort of prevention response uh, initiative. What distinguishes a good one from a run of the mill one? What does it take to pull the leadership together? to allow people to have both good responsive capacity and then also the foresight to, to bring the systems together. That's sort of all, so I'll close mine with a question that goes to the main point about, about governance and silo busting as being part of the resilience. I, I think that's a, a, a wonderful question and a wonderful theme, governance and silo building on, on which to end this. Yeah, I, um, since it's 127 and we can't possibly end two minutes early, I, I wanted to say uh, one thing. I, one of the kind of, I'm, I'm still putting the pieces together, so I want to think about this some more, but what I'm trying to, uh, what I really liked about that conversation towards the end was this sort of sense that, that you know, we started with a framework, right, as a way to help us think about a policy response. But we had kind of ended up saying that it's really important not just to have a framework, but to really have some foresight about where your community is going. Um, and ultimately, you, I would add to that, uh, uh, kind of you really need to have a, a policy framework that is comprehensive um, and um, has alignment of the right kind of performance measures and, and the right kind of incentives and, and accountability you know, to, to achieve the results. And so when you kind of take this all together, you have kind of a, a new framework for helping us think differently about our problems. We have the data that you're generating in urban and, uh, and others are generating about where is our community going and how can we plan. And you have to have a conversation about what does this data mean, right, that leads to a policy response that is interdisciplinary and uh, forward-looking um, and, and ultimately an accountability structure, right, for ensuring that, that these different systems work together and, and, and monitoring your results and checking it in. I mean, it's really, we've just kind of described, I think, the elements of, of, of a good policy response. And I, I would say that we're not really doing nearly enough of this right now, right? There, there, obviously, there's good policies out there, and obviously, there's great thinking, and there's wonderful dedication. But the framework, the policy framework, and the decision-making framework in which people are operating is just not good enough. It is not taking advantage of what we know. Um, and, and we need to get there. And I think all, you know, certainly APT and Urban and, and others, you know, we're all happy to help people get there. We want your help too in the audience about how do we get there and how do we apply these ideas. So, so you know, you're, you're sending a lot of questions. Keep them coming. Uh, uh, this, uh, uh, you know, send any additional questions you want. Any questions you didn't get answered, send them to my email there, uh, Jeffrey. I answer all of the questions. Thank you.